Petrol, like it or not, it's been fueling the world for the last 100 years, and between 2023 and 2024, the UK alone burned through 17 billion litres of the stuff. But where does it come from, and how does it get to the petrol pump? The simple answer is that you dig oil out of the ground, refine it into petrol, and send it off to a petrol station. But where exactly in England does that happen, and what sort of infrastructure and facilities are required? Well, what do you say we take a little bit of a journey to find out? Come on. First, we need some oil. Located hundreds of miles from here between the Shetland Islands and Norway, underneath 140 metres of the harsh North Sea is the Brent oil field, perhaps the most well-known oil field discovered by Shell in 1971. It was one of the largest oil fields ever discovered, and at the time it was the most northerly oil well, but how did they even get to it? In the old days, you'd use a drilling boat, which is as the name suggests. The problem with these is that they can be quite unstable in rough seas, which is exactly what the North Sea is, all of the time. So that wasn't going to work. Instead, they used a specially designed semi-submersible platform. These look a bit like oil rigs, and I suppose they are. They're used for oil field discovery and to drill the initial oil well connection, and they're far more stable and secure when compared to boats. So Shell banged one together over a weekend with a few beers and had it towed out into the North Sea, where it was used to explore and discover oil fields where it stumbled across the Brent oil field. They used the platform to drill a discovery well to double check, and yep, they found ground up dinosaurs from around 170 million years ago. Now that we've got our oil, we need to bring it up to the surface, and to do that, we need one of these, an oil rig. This is Brent Charlie, one of four oil platforms that was in the Brent oil field. There was Brent Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta, and these things are absolutely massive. This is just the top section weighing, I don't even know, over 30,000 tons. They're almost like small villages operated by a crew of near 400. It's the bit that you can't see that's perhaps most impressive. The 160 meter long, 20 meter wide concrete legs that the main rigs sit on are amazing things. Of course, there are four legs for each platform, which combined weigh 300,000 tons, the same as the Empire State Building. The leg walls are one meter thick and contained within are oil storage cells some 60 meters long, and it's said that there's enough space in the storage cells to fit Nelson's column. But that's nothing compared to the depth that these things can drill down to. You'd like to think that the oil is neatly deposited below the seabed in one easy to reach area, but unfortunately that's not the case, and several drilling points and wells are required to best extract the oil. Once you've gone the 140 odd meters down to the seabed, you then need to drill a further 2,600 meters down to reach the oil reserves in the Brent oil field. Field. To do that, you need a pretty long drill, and yeah, that's sort of what oil rigs are for. From the platform, you deploy, in very simple terms, a pipe or casing that contains a huge drill bit. The further down you drill, the more pipe and drill bit you add on, which is why we're able to drill to such incredible depths. Interestingly, you don't have to drill straight down. The pipes and drills can be angled and steered to an extent, and most oil rigs will have several pipes accessing different parts of an oil reservoir. But if all of that seems like a hassle, and it is, are there any other options? Dorset. It's one of the finest places in England. It's beautiful, stunning, home to the UNESCO World Heritage Jurassic Coastline, and sat on a massive oil field. This is Kimmeridge Oil Derrick, the oldest running oil pump in the UK that's been continuously operating since 1961, predating the Brent oil field and its oil rigs. The search for oil in Dorset began in 1935, and after a couple of decades of searching, they discovered that under this picturesque part of England lay three oil reservoirs that would become known as Kimmeridge, Wareham and Witch Farm the latter of those being the largest of the three. The Kimmeridge Oil Derrick, nicknamed the Nodding Donkey, is a small single beam pump that at full capacity can extract 350 barrels of oil a day from 350 meters underground, which isn't too bad for a little pump like this. We don't see these pumps all that often in England. Most of our oil is extracted from offshore rigs, but that doesn't mean that Kimmeridge is the only one. Just up the road is the Witch Farm oil field, the largest in Dorset, and actually it's the largest onshore oil field in Western Europe. Say what? A massive oil field in everyone's favorite holiday destination. When did that happen? In the 1970s, with the installation of the Witch Farm oil wells and processing plant, there are several sites like this around the country, usually very well hidden from view, and across a few pumping stations, Witch Farm would produce 110,000 barrels of oil a day at the height of its operation. It's still going today, but extracting around half that at 50,000 barrels a day. Interestingly, the Kimmeridge Oil Derrick and another site in nearby Wareham ship their oil to Witch Farm for processing and further transport, along with what the site itself produces. 
And that's the next step in the process, I suppose. Now we've extracted our oil, we need to send it somewhere, either to a refinery or to a storage location. In the case of the North Sea oil fields, there are underwater pipelines connecting the oil rigs to a terminal known as the Sullum Vo Oil Terminal, which is located on the island of Shetland. It has 16 storage tanks, each with a 600,000 barrel capacity, and from here the oil is distributed to various refineries across Europe. The onshore Witch Farm oil field sends its oil via a 50-odd mile long underground pipeline directly to storage facilities and a refinery known as Forley. From here, some of the oil is sent over the river or estuary maybe to an oil storage site in Hamble le Bryce. What a silly name. That oil storage site has a pier and terminal where oil can be loaded onto ships and sent off to wherever it's needed. But some of that oil will make its way into the Forley refinery for refining. In principle, it's a fairly straightforward process. You need to heat up some crude oil in a large distillation tank, and as the oil vapour rises, it distills and cools into various products, including what we need to make petrol. We just simply collect up the various distilled products and off we go. In reality, it's a lot more complex than that, especially when you want to refine oil en masse. It requires huge amounts of infrastructure to meet modern day demands, which is why refineries like the one here at Forley tend to be rather massive. Forley Refinery was first put into use in the early 1920s on only 670 acres of land, but over the years it's expanded and now covers well over 3,000 acres. Forley represents around 20% of the UK's refining capacity, processing 270,000 barrels of oil every day, some of which comes directly from UK sources, but the majority from elsewhere. The oil is turned into a range of products including petrol, diesel, jet fuel, butane and propane and propane accessories. And Forley also features a chemical plant that can make all of the nice things like solvents, plasticizers and polymers. With our oil now processed and turned into fuel, we can distribute the fuel via road, ship and rail. But in the case of Forley, 70% of the products are sent out via pipelines. There are two main pipeline systems in England known as the SO Pipeline and the Exelon Pipeline. The SO Pipeline sends fuel directly from Forley Refinery to places like Heathrow Airport and Avonmouth Docks where it can then be exported. However, Forley also has a connection to Hamble le Rice, you may remember from earlier. And using that connection, fuel can also be sent via the Exelon Pipeline to many other locations. And this pipeline is rather interesting because the vast majority of the system is a leftover from the second small disagreement of 1939 to 1945. Known as the Government Pipeline and Storage System, GPSS for short, it was a top secret 1,600 mile network of pipes and depots designed to deliver 800,000 tonnes of fuel all around the country, mostly to the hundreds of airfields. It was absolutely vital to the war effort, but once all of that calmed down, the pipelines were used to send aviation fuel, for example, from Forley to Heathrow. Because of its sensitive nature, the GPSS pipeline network was kept secret, and even today, the precise route of some sections aren't known. However, on the odd occasion, the secret under ground pipeline might need to show itself to cross over, say, a river. Like this one in Whitminster, Gloucestershire. This is the River Froome and it's one of the few locations in the country where you can catch a glimpse of what was once a top secret wartime pipeline. This pipeline connects the Avonmouth docks to the Stanlow refinery in the north, making several stops along the way via fuel storage sites and depots. Whilst not connected to that pipeline, a good example of a fuel storage depot is the Bunsfield Depot found in Hemel Hempstead, Hertfordshire. It opened in 1968 as a joint venture between the various oil companies and they continue to share the facility to this day. At the height of its operation, it had a 273 million litre fuel capacity and 400 tankers would visit the site every day. And then it blew up. No, really. On an early Sunday morning at 6am in 2005, residents were awoken to the sounds of huge explosions. Actually, most of the south of England heard it because the sound was recorded up to 125 miles away from the site. It all happened because of a faulty filling valve. Whilst the large storage tanks were being filled with fuel, the valve failed, resulting in fuel being spilled out via the tank's overflow. Interestingly, the fuel itself wasn't deemed to be the cause, but instead the fuel vapour that formed and mixed with the air, creating an incredibly unstable and flammable cloud that ignited taking out a quarter of the site with it. Despite being the largest fire in Europe since around the 1939 to 1945 sort of time, and it taking five days to extinguish, and it destroying a large chunk of the depot as well as most of the surrounding industrial estate, no one died, and I think we had a very lucky escape there. Had it been 9.30 Monday morning, things might have been very different. It's usually from storage sites like Bunsfield where our fuel is distributed to the retailers. Whilst the storage sites are often shared between companies, they're storing their own fuel mixes, so some tanker trucks will deliver to Shell petrol stations, some to BP, some to supermarkets, etc. 
Your typical tanker truck in England has a capacity of around 36,000 litres, although to be fair they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Fuel is pumped from the truck into underground storage tanks via the pipe connections that you've no doubt spotted at your local filling station. And like the trucks, petrol stations come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, with the underground tanks varying from as small as a 1,000 litre capacity tank right up to a massive 100,000 litre capacity. The last step is to put the fuel in your car, using an invention that predates the car. The first petrol pumps came about in the mid-1880s, and they weren't petrol pumps at all. They dispensed kerosene, which was used as a fuel for lighting. The first pumps used for automotive purposes came about in 1901 and was put together by a Norwegian bloke known as John Tockheim. His design was based on a modified water pump, and it allowed for the accurate measure of the fuel being dispensed. And it must have been good because Tockheim became, and is now, a huge company manufacturing petrol pumps that are used all over the world, and you've most likely used a tock iron pump without even realising. So let's review. We've located oil in the North Sea or Dorset, accessed it via a semi-submersible platform and massive drill, installed an oil rig or pump, connected some pipe work, extracted the oil and sent it to a refinery for processing to be turned into fuel. It's then exported or distributed to storage sites around the country via a huge underground pipe system. If the storage site doesn't blow up, it's then put into tanker trucks who deliver it to the retailers and pump it into tanks. Which is then later pumped back out and into our vehicles. It's as easy as that. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks very much for watching, like and subscribe and all that bollocks and I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye bye. It's stunning. Beautiful. Nearly fell over. Oh, do I see it? Fucking hell, I fell over. The UK alone burned through 17 billion litres of the stuff, but where does it fear and where does it fear? Which is then later pumped. Like and subscribe and all that bollocks, and I'll see you guys next time. Hey!